next speaker, uh, Sam Bellen, and I am uh, I'm, I'm kind of glad that we moved your talk as the last one because of the title. So <laughs> that's out of scope. Sounds like a perfect way to end the, the track. And I'm, I'm, I can't wait. What is going to be out of scope? So, <laughs> well, hopefully by the end of the talk, we'll know what's going to be. Yeah, that, that's what I'm hoping. <laughs> okay. So, uh, you have your slides and you I've, I've seen the backstage chat they should be awesome uh, or something so <laughs> take it away sam i'm seeing the slides everything looks good thank you very much um and thank you everybody for joining me for this last tag of the day i believe i think it's the last tag of the day um so thank you for sticking around um and like uh, like she said the title of this talk is Dead Out of Scope because initially I wanted to do a 20 minute rant about scopes and permissions, but then I was like, that might not be the nicest thing to do to just go on and on for 20 minutes about scopes. Um, so maybe I should call this talk for three X's denied because I'm going to start with a little bit of uh, about access control and uh, give you some basics and, and go over certain types of access controls. And then we're going to transition to permissions and scopes. So it's a bit more than only scopes, but we'll get to the scopes by the end of this talk anyway. Um, a little bit about myself. My name is Sam Bellum from Belgium, and I'm a developer advocate engineer at Auth0. And if you've never heard about Auth0 before, that's okay. That's totally fine. We're an identity as a service provider, which basically means that we try to make it as easy as possible for anybody to implement a secure authentication flow so you can focus on building your actual products, your applications, your APIs, all the things you actually want to be building. I'm also a Google developer expert, and you can find me on the internet as Atsamego. All right, um, we have a virtual booth. Um, I know it's the end of the conference, but if you still have some questions about all zero the product, feel free to pop into our booth and uh, some of my colleagues might be there to answer your questions. So what we will be talking about today, I mentioned this in the introduction, uh, we're going to talk about um, access control um, and to be specific, attribute-based access control and role-based access control, which are the two main types of access control that um, are often implemented into our APIs and systems. Um, and after the, we've talked about these two types, we're going to go to permissions versus scopes, like the initial title mentions, that's out of scope. And if you have some time at the end, um, we might open it up for some questions. So if you have questions, feel free to pop them into the chat and I'll have a look after the talk if we have some time. Okay, access control. What is access control? Um, to me, access control is the art of regulating who can do what on your system. And I call it an art because there's no real rules about how you tackle this is always a, a use case that you have to decide for your own system, your own archi architecture, um, but it basically defines who can do what on your system. Um, and the first one is attribute-based access control, also sometimes known as policy-based access control. And um, this, this access control um, paradigm, it, it usually um, implements a few attributes. The most common ones are user, environment, resource, and actions. Where the user are some attributes that are related to the user. What's the role or the job of this user? Um, is it part of an organization um, or maybe multiple organizations? Does it have a certain security clearance and so forth? So everything that's related to the user can be called a user attribute. An environment attribute is something that is related to the environment in the broad sense of the word. Maybe it's a time of the day. Maybe it's a location of the data. Maybe it's the current threat level. Are, is your organization under a, an attack at the moment that might change um, who gets access to what in certain scenarios. The resource um, is everything that's related to the actual resource, the thing we want to do something with. Um, so when was it created? Who owns it? Is the data of this resource, is it sensitive or not? All those kind of things that are related to the actual resource we want to do something with. And lastly, the action. Do you want to read the resource? Do you want to write to it? Do you want to delete it? Do you want to do something else with it? All of those things are action attributes. Okay, so if we look at an example, any engineer can write to any file if you are currently not experiencing a DDoS attack. So there's four of those attributes in this sentence, all four of them to be uh, exact. Um, and the first one, any engineer, that's a user attribute because engineer might be the job of the or the role of the user. To write, that's an action. Um, we want to write to a resource and that resource is any file in this case, and this is a very broad example, any file is a resource. Um, and if we are not currently uh, experiencing a DDoS attack, is something that is environmentally related. 
Another example, an accountant can upload an invoice if it's during their working hours, where the accountant, again, is a user attribute. Upload is an action. An invoice is, an, uh, is a resource or is an attribute related to the resource. And during working hours um, is something that's based on the environment. Because maybe sometimes you don't want your employees to access files or to upload files when they are not supposed to be working for security reasons, for example. And lastly, an HR representative can look up personal details if the subject is part of the local branch. Again, the HR representative is a job of this person, of the user, so it's something that's related to the user, a user attribute to look up. It's, a, it's an action. Personal details, in this case, is uh, something that's related to the resource. It's a resource attribute. And then if, if it's part of their local branch, it's something um, that's environmental, because maybe this HR representative can only access anything anything to related to um, employees of their local branch. Also for privacy reasons, for example. So attribute-based access control allows for a fine-grained control over all possible actions in your infrastructure. Um, and this can be very fine-grained depending on how deep you go down the rabbit hole when implementing ABAC. Um, but depending on your architecture or organization, this might be overkill. Um, because it takes a lot of configuration of figuring out all of the attributes and the combinations of those attributes. So if you have a simple product, a simple um, architecture or a simple system, this might just be overkill. That's up to you and your team to decide if you want to go down the rabbit hole of ABAC or if you want to do something else. Um, and that's something else might be RBAC. And RBAC stands for role-based access control. So instead of using attributes or a policy, like we also sometimes call this, we're going to use roles. Um, and it's good to know that a user can have one or more roles. So a, a user does not have only one role, or can uh, it can sometimes can have more than one role. Um, depends also on how complex your system is. Um, and some roles that we commonly see might be an admin role, um, an engineer role, a guest role, and so forth. And then these roles can have one or more permissions, depending on how many actions and permissions you have in your application or in your system. You might assign them to a role, um, and you might assign more than one permission to a role. So a user can have multiple roles, and a role can have multiple permissions. And some, um, some examples of permissions are to read a resource, to write a resource, to delete a resource, um, common tasks we do with our systems. So for example, a guest is able to, to read all documentation. A guest is a role and to read is a permission. While an engineer in your organization might be able to read and edit all of the documentation just because when it writes some new functionality, um, they also might want to update the documentation, for example. Um, and an admin can not only read and edit like an engineer, but they can also delete documentation. So depending on which role you have, there's more or less actions you can, you can perform on this documentation. Um, so depending on your architecture, a user that can perform all actions might have an admin role or both the engineering and admin role or both the guest engineering and admin role, whatever makes sense to you, uh, which means that sometimes you define all permissions to each of those roles. And sometimes you make it a bit more fine grained where you just, um, define the extra permissions that are not part of the base role, um, to some other roles. Um, and you assign all of those roles to a user if they need to have that access. So either the admin role has all permissions because it's the admin or the permissions are split between the engineer role where you can read and write um, and the admin role can delete the documentation, for example. And if you have a look at the Alt Zero dashboard, you see that I have a different example in this case, but we have two roles, the premium and the user role, um, where the user role will be the default role that every user gets. And the premium role will be assigned to people that have paid for our product. Um, in this case, we're going to assume that our product is an advertising website or maybe something like eBay, for example. Um, and these basic roles that are, uh, the basic permissions that are assigned to the user role are advertisement create and read. So a basic user can create advertisements and they can read advertisements. Um, but if you pay for it, you can also promote advertisements, which means that those advertisements would be uh, displayed on top of the page. So you can see that premium has both roles defined in the user role plus the extra advertisement colon promote role. Um, and often you can get these roles by querying some API endpoint on your authorization server um, for permissions, and then you can use those permissions 
but you don't always have to do this. For example, if you use Alt-0 and you enable the RBAC in your, um, in your tenants, you can also choose to add the permissions to the access token, which is a clever way to um, avoid you having to do that manual check with the authorization endpoint for permissions, because we will include them into the access token. And if you then look into your access token, you can find um, an array with all the permissions assigned to the user. So should you check permissions or roles on your API application? That's a question I commonly get, and the answer is always, it depends. Um, checking for roles is simpler. Usually you have a few roles, um, but you might have a bunch of permissions assigned to those roles. Um, but checking for permissions is a bit more fine-grained and flexible. Um, as your product grows, maybe you will create more roles, and the roles might be split into separate roles. So it, it, it requires a little bit more maintenance if you check for roles. While if you check for permission, usually that permission is going to stay the same or might not change as often as the roles do. Lastly, permissions via scopes. As I promised in the title, we're going to talk a little bit about what a permission is and what a scope is. But let's start with defining what a scope is. Because scopes get used a lot and they get um, substituted by permissions and some people confuse them once in a while. Um, so a scope is a mechanism for in OAuth 2.0 to limit an application's access to a user's account. An application can request one or more scopes. This information is then presented to the user in the consent screen and the access token issued to the application will be limited to the scopes granted. This is the definition on auth.net slash two slash scope. Um, but what this means in a little, little bit less words is scopes are permissions. So scope is a permission granted by the user, not to the user, but by the user to a third party. So it's not your own API, but a third party when we're working in a delegation scenario. Um, and it's when using the auth2 or the OpenID Connect framework. And because they're defined by auth2 and OpenID Connect is just built on top of auth2, scopes only come into play when working with auth2 or OpenID Connect. So a little example, uh, what I mean with a delegation scenario, uh, a user wants to import all contacts from their Gmail account. This is something you might have uh, come across on the internet uh, in the last year or so. It's a common scenario that we once in a while see. Um, so a user wants to import all contacts from the Gmail account. Um, the application is going to request the contacts.read only scope um, to Gmail. And a user will authenticate and approve or deny the requested scope. So when your application requests that permission, that scope to Gmail, Gmail will show a consent screen to the user and the user can decide to approve or deny that scope. This is how it looks like. Um, whenever you grant some scopes to um, a Google service, you will see the screen. In this case, see and download your contacts. And the application can import all contacts if and only if the user approved the scope. So if the user denied that scope, the application has no way of accessing, um, reading the context of the user because the user has to uh, approve that scope or multiple scopes if the application uh, requested multiple scopes. So if we put it side by side, permissions and scopes, a permission is a general authorization concept. It's something that we see in every authorization concept. Um, while scopes are something that is defined by the OAuth 2.0 slash OIDC, OpenID Connect framework. Uh, permissions are used by a first party. So if you want to call your own API, while scopes are usually or always used with third party um, scenarios when you do some delegation, even though a scope can be a permission, it's not always exactly a one-to-one -one mappable. Um, and a permission is granted to a user. You grant permissions to your user. Um, while a scope is granted by the user. The user has to approve the scopes that your application uh, requests in name of that user. And if they deny it, the application cannot do those certain actions. And a user usually has no direct control over which roles assigned, uh, are assigned to him because just that's something that your application does, your system does. Um, while with scopes, they can limit what an application can do on behalf of the user. Um, but if you want to read more about scopes, and, and, and permissions, or my colleague Vittorio Bertocci wrote a very good blog post on our Alt Zero blog. So um, feel free to read that after this talk. So let's summarize. Attribute based access control offers a fine grained control, but it's quite complex and not always necessary. Sometimes it's just overkill to implement attribute based access control. 
Role-based access control defines permissions and assigns them to roles. A user can have multiple roles. So a user can have multiple roles and a role can have multiple uh, permissions assigned to those roles. Scopes come into play with a delegation scenario, but should not be used for first party APIs. That's it. Um, if you would like to see these slides again, you can find them at access.sambiga.tech. Um, and if you have any questions, either find me on Twitter, drop them in the chat right now, or come find me in the Odzero booth um, after this talk in the Partners Village for as long as the conference lasts. Any questions? Like I said, um, tweet them or drop them in the chat. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sam. It was a really good kind of uh, overview of all the possible ways that you can <laughs> secure the access to APIs. And, and, and a lot of those ways are often not known or not understood properly. So mm -hmm. thank you for that. And actually, just before, I don't know if you see the, so, so the previous talk, but did, there was, yeah. yeah, there were these questions about <laughs> the scopes and stuff so i mm -hmm. think that this was the perfect one to end if there are any questions to sam please put them now on the chat or forever hold your peace or however they say um so i was, I was like, <laughs> yeah <laughs> no but we had like childcare here already on apis and i i said that i have given my like first api talk was uh, about the 12 month pregnancy on on apis so okay you know the marriage is a normal uh thing to come after that mm. but hey i i was kind of struggling to to uh figure out what what happened here um suddenly the stage chat is saying something okay now oh yes okay um <laughs> i'm i saw there's a question okay so are there any best practices for user access tokens and how many roles etc you should provide in the access token yep um so what you have to realize when we put them in an access token and add zero is which means we create a json map token um, which will contain a JSON body and that JSON body will contain all of the scopes. But the more scopes you define and assign to a user, the more scopes will appear into that JSON body, which means that your access token will become bigger and bigger and bigger. Now, an access token is something you're going to send with each request to an API endpoint that needs authentication. Um, so the bigger it gets, the, the slower it will be. So usually we try to limit to the absolute um, necessary amount of, of scopes or permissions. Um, just because you want to keep that access token as small as possible because we send it with each request. Yeah, I mean, the scopes are just the one thing there. I mean, you can identify or, or like limit the user's access with other information that is in the tokens. And especially, mm -hmm. I, I, I totally agree on the kind of heavy lifting the token uh, because if you have API management solution, let's say that uses the token to and or validates the token and maybe it passes over to some microservices, then there's a lot of places that need to deal with it. Um, it might be really costly over, overall. So then uh, there's another question. Why <laughs> why Okta bought Auth0? Uh, I'm not sure if you want to answer That's this. related to this talk. Um, so yeah, let's I think so. Permissions and scopes. Um, I can only say yeah. that they bought Auth0. Yeah. Uh, so, Anyway, if there's any further questions uh, for Sam, please do not hesitate to put them into the chat. And I'm sure that you gave a lot of ways to contact you in, in Twitter and you guys have the booth here and mm -hmm. everything. So uh, there's still plenty of time to get connected. Uh, although this is the last talk and we are going to finish with this. so. I would say that uh, thank you for um, some for your talk and you make me. sure your APIs are safe and make sure you are safe with these weird times that we are living. So thank you, Sam. And we'll uh, move over to the closing words and hoping that stage two and the workshops and the other guys in the round tables are pretty finished too. So thank you, Sam, for being here. Thank you.
And now I'm trying to look at my many monitors here and understand what's going on the other stages. But uh, if any of you have any questions or comments that you would like anybody to answer, just put them on the chat. And uh, then I will start going um, through the kind of last motions of this event. So uh, one good question there, key cloak better than Alt zero. Well, that is a question that you probably need to actually um, try yourself. Both have really good benefits and really good different use cases. Uh, so other than other questions, please feel free to put them there. And otherwise, if uh, Dennis, my dear track manager, if you can put uh, the screen share on stage. Thank you. So remember, we have the sponsors to thank for uh, this being a free event. And I'm sure that you have all visited the booths and you have gone to the um, the uh, uh, materials that are available there and to the workshops and roundtables. And I would like to thank also Zero, Datastax, IBM, Software AG, Tyke, and all the others that made this possible. So we had uh, Silver sponsors, Datadog, Friends, Dira, and APIable.io. And if any of you want to be speaking at API Day's event, then please uh, do not hesitate to put your speaker applications uh, into the next event. And obviously Helsinki and North is going to come up, but there are some other events around the world. And stay with the community. There's quite a lot of things happening. There's um, some other events and, and some women in APIs activities. And there's for, especially for women speakers or speaker candidates, there's uh, this uh, coaching with Claire Barrett, me and, and some of the others in the community coming up soon, the next cohort. So make sure you get there too. And the recordings of this event are going to be available after the event uh, in, in a week or so. And I hope that you will all look at them with your uh, teams and go through the interesting parts and some of the talks that you missed. So my name is Marek Kanina and I'm from Osango and we will um, want to help you with anything that is related to APS together with all these wonderful sponsors that we have. And we need you to sponsor more in the future so to keep this growing community grow, uh, growing even more. So remember that too. Thank you everyone. And it has been a pleasure to see you here. And hopefully you had time to visit all most of the talks that you wanted to visit. See you next year, if not sooner.